welcome our panel to the, great, the Awakening 2013. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. And what a, a privilege and an honor it is to be in this uh, great uh, church and this great event that Matt and everybody at Liberty Council hosts. My name is Tony Collado. You'd, uh, boy, it felt like about six cups of Cuban coffee after you finished that. <laughs> That's right. It is. It is. It is. You know, folks, the next 20 to 30 to 40 years of elections are going to be determined by the Hispanic vote in this country. Is everybody aware of that? That's a lot of years. I think a lot of people a couple years ago and a couple in an election before that were a little frustrated. Imagine if that goes on and on and on till 2050 and 2054. And, and you're going, wow, Tony, I don't want to see that. The Hispanics in this country, which now total 50 million, are conservative mostly, almost all of them, in nature. They love life. They love family. But unfortunately... They have been kidnapped by the left, which has lied to them about a, a thousand different things. And unfortunately, some, not many, but some on the right, with strange rhetoric of attack and where they're not embracing the Hispanics. A natural constituency that would love to be embraced by a conservative movement. And today, this is one of the most important panels you'll listen to. And we're not here to say, to talk to you about all the problems there are. We, we really want to put an action plan together in this 45 minutes uh, about some tangible solutions, about embracing this constituency and bringing them under to be able to vote Judeo-Christian values in this country. Okay, I'm blessed to have, you know, seven Christian radio stations across the country that we've launched in about 300 different ministries. And when I talk to those folks, it's the most explosive growth, and Sam will talk about it. He's got 40,000 churches under his umbrella. The biggest explosion going on right now is the Hispanic evangelical movement in this country. Yet in the churches, many don't vote, and half of them don't understand conservative principles. So we need to teach them. And we have an amazing panel here today. Yuri Montilla. Sam Rodriguez, Dr. Juan Torres, Cindy Jacobs, and Congressman Steve Pierce from New Mexico. And what I want to do is just share, uh, for them to share a, a minute or two of who they are, their bio, and, uh, and then uh, we can go on to uh, some other matters as well. Why don't you start, Yuri? Thank you, Tony. Uh, Yuri Mantilla, Associate Professor of Law at Liberty University. So that, that, was a, that was a quick bio, Yuri. I'm Sam Rodriguez, and I am uh, Tony's caddy. That's my title. <laughs> He's Tiger Woods, and I'm the caddy. Go ahead. Juan Torres, I am a doctor. I work here in Orlando. I was born in Ecuador, and uh, I became American citizen more than 20 years ago. And my goal mainly right now is to try to save this country, reaching out to the Hispanic community. Amen. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cindy Jacobs. I'm the cheerleader on this panel. For the Latino people, we have a 50-state prayer network, United States Reformation Prayer Network, and we are committed to see that we all stand together as the family of God. I'm Steve Pierce. I represent the 2nd District of New Mexico, which is Texas to Arizona, Albuquerque to Mexico, 770,000 square miles, 52% uh, Hispanic. And doing a great job, by the way. Um, and again, my name is Tony Calati. I'm the national director for Salem Español, uh, Salem Communications, 100 radio stations across the country. I run Miami's three stations and uh, the seven stations across the country in Spanish. And I'm also chairman of a group called Conservadores. We were one of the earlier supporters of Marco Rubio. Um, and uh, you can, yeah, you can applaud. He's a great man. And... Um, so let's, let's get on with it. I, I, before anything else, I wanted to, to, to ask the congressman. Uh, he has some, some very important points and, and, and thoughts. So, so I wanted to give you the mic, congressman, to, to start things off. Well, thank you very much. As uh, you can see, I'm not Hispanic. I'm not uh, the average profile that, uh, that people pick out uh, 
the day after the election, I had a guy from the Wall Street Journal call and say, uh, you are the only Anglo that wins with such a large population of Hispanics. How do you do it? I said, I don't know. Why don't you come watch? And he said, uh, you'd let me ride with you. I said, yeah. We start early and we work late. So he came to New Mexico about three months ago. We started at 6 o'clock at Roberto's, a little small little place where we can get uh, the world's largest enchilada if you choose to do that. And we worked about 20 events uh, from 6 a.m. to about, about 10 at night, twice in a row. And he said, you're going to do this tomorrow too, aren't you? He's leaving. I said, I'm going to do it the rest of the year. Now, I don't know what you, but I don't see the Hispanics as someone we've got to outreach to. I see them as a part of the constituency. And the reason that we as conservatives do not appeal to them is because we do not speak to them. That's it. I know that sounds way too simple, but I know that we're not going to convince them with 30-second TV ads. We're not going to sit in air-conditioned offices and make calls into their homes. Christ did not teach that way. He got dust on his feet. He did not have a three-piece suit. And when we, as conservatives, want to speak to any group, it doesn't matter if they're Hispanic, black, if they're Asian, we must be there. So I was at a LULAC convention. If you know LULAC, it's not exactly a conservative group, but I showed up because they asked me to come and they wanted a forum and they worked me over pretty well. At the back of the room, in a group about this size, one guy came up and said, I'm Hispanic. I'm a professor at the university here. I'm very liberal, and I will never vote for someone like you. But he said, I have never heard the conservative message articulated the way that you have. He said, you're going to cause me to pause and think. I don't think I'm going to re-register, but you have put something in my head. Arna Artalejo is in a, in a small area, about... 90% Hispanic, 90% poor, and 90% Democrat. She was in that Wall Street Journal article that came out about a month ago saying, I don't agree with Steve on this, 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 but I absolutely will vote for him and President Obama because he comes to our community. We see him here more than we see the local mayor. And my friends, if we as conservatives are ever going to get that demographic, we as conservatives have to show up because we've been identified in a different way. And the people in those Hispanic communities simply believe what they've been told. We're not going to convince them out there. We're going to convince them from among them. The same as Christ convinced people who did not believe in him. We're going to have to go into uncomfortable places and speak to uncomfortable venues. We're truly going to have to love our neighbor. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Well said. Very good. Cindy Jacobs, globetrotter. I talked to her last week. I'm going to Guatemala. just got back from Brazil. I'm going to... I'm like, oh, my goodness gracious. About 2 million uh, frequent flyer miles. But seemingly everywhere she goes, she blesses people. And, uh, and that's what it's all about. And uh, Cindy, why don't you share uh, some words from your heart? I, I, I know you've had a couple of things you want to share. Yeah, if you could put up those slides. I have two slides. Uh, could you put that up on the board? First of all, I've asked them to put up a slide of a, a picture of what we look like. This is our family. The problem is we talk about political distinctives, but in Christ, we are a family. This is not a Latino to me. This is my brother. This is my brother. This is my family. And so if you put up the next slide, I just was writing and praying about what does a family look like. This is who we are. We're all born again into a family. Number two, this distinctive gives us common values as a family of God. Number three, therefore we need to learn to function together on a family basis. We're very dysfunctional right now. We have cousins that don't like each other. We have some that think, you know, they're this race or that race, but we have got to learn to celebrate our cousins, our nieces, our nephews, whatever color they may be. Number four, family distinctives and values trump political distinctives. Number five, our vote must be consistent with our father's family values. Number six, no divorcing ourselves from family of God values, regardless of race, personal need, or external non-family relationships. I am on this panel 
because I do not know any people group on the face of the earth that believes in family more than Latinos. And I am here because I know that God has brought people that are Latinos here to teach us something. We needed something in America. They are people that must be celebrated. They, we have got to learn from them. And I want to tell you something. God has given them the playing field. He has given it to them. So first of all, we have to humble ourselves and learn from them. Second of all, we have to celebrate them. And third of all, we have to learn to be family together with them. And this may sound very, very simplistic, but I think that if we take this down to biblical denominators and we begin to function like this, that we are going to easily deal with the political issues because these are kingdom distinctives. Thank you very much, Cindy. (laughs) Dr. Juan Torres, homebred here in the Orange County, Orlando area, and a man with principles and a a conservative man. Uh, What's in your heart tonight? Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this meeting. Uh, I concentrate and focus on the Hispanic community because I do realize how important the Hispanics are become to uh, decide elections across the United States. Um, People ask all the time why, and the reason is the numbers. We we need to realize the numbers. We're living living a different uh, 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 time right now. Reaching out to Hispanics is one of the biggest challenges we have had for years and probably for generations to come. Unless we realize the problem we are facing now, we're not gonna be able to win elections anymore. As Tony mentioned, we have more than 50 million Hispanics living in the United States. About every hour, every hour, 70 Hispanics reach the voting age. This past election, 24 million Hispanics were registered to vote. Only half of them voted. I don't know if that was good or bad, but that was the case. It is impossible these days, and will be impossible in the future, to win elections at the national level, local or state level, without having the Hispanic support. And when people ask why Hispanic voted the way they voted, I always have the same answer. I say the media. We do not have, we do not have good representation for the Hispanic conservative in the United States when it comes to the media. With very, very few exceptions, like the Heritage Foundation, for example, when you combine what the left has done to this country for more than 30 years, that explains why. The Huffington Post in Spanish, CNN in Spanish, Yahoo in Spanish, Terra, Telemundo, NBC Latino. When you combine that, you have the answer. Mm-hmm. It is time that we realize that we need to change the strategies. Mm-hmm. We cannot be doing the same thing. The left and the liberals want you to do what you're doing now because they know they will win the next election. There are ways to do it. And the Hispanics will listen. I was one of them. I am still a Hispanic. I'm an American now. <laughs> and I can tell you something. 90% of the Hispanics believe in God, whether they are Christian or not Christians. No Hispanic moved to this country thinking that he going to find maybe another man to marry. No Hispanic come to this country because he's looking for another Hugo Chavez. No Cuban jump in the waters to risk his life or her life because he or she think they're going to find another Fidel Castro. That's right. That's good phrase. Yeah. Hispanics are here for one reason, America. America the way it used to be and America the way that has to be forever. I want you to pay attention to the, to the Hispanic vote because we depend on them. Harry Reid was re-elected because of the Hispanic vote. 
and President Obama was reelected with the Hispanic vote. 72%, he got a 68% the first time. If somebody believes that we did a good job, you, excuse me, but you don't know what you're talking about. We did not do a good job, but we can do it. With the help of God and the help of everybody, we can do it. We can save this country. Thank you. <clears throat> To his point about Univision and Huffington Post, 26 years ago, my father had a radio show for many years in, in Miami, and there was a young couple about 26 years old. It was a Spanish broadcast, kind of an anti-Castro radio station, and this guy had left Cuba, had uh, fled Cuba, and was on my father's radio show. And um, it was very interesting, and I caught the last end of it, and then when he came outside, I talked to him and said, hey, Jose, how you doing? It's good talking to you. Let me ask you a question. You get over here? Yeah, I fled. Uh, well, you fled from Cuba? Yeah, but I was in Cuba, and then they sent me to the Soviet Union when I was 19. I go, That's interesting. What would you go there for? And he goes, no, they, they, they sent me to, uh, to go to school. That's interesting. So you went to school. How many years did you go to school in the Soviet Union? Five years? Oh, okay. What did you study? One thing. Influence of the masses. That was the only thing he studied. I'll never forget that. I'm sharing it with you 26 years later. The guy looked at me and went like this. One thing, influence of the masses, because they were going to teach him so he can go back to Pinar del Rio in Cuba and run a 10-mile area and influence the masses. What is Univision doing? What is the Huffington Post doing? CNN en Español doing? They're influencing the masses. What do we need to do? As I was talking to Sam earlier, and we're in the process of putting together a lot of projects to build a very big Hispanic conservative radio infrastructure across the country. It's influence of the masses. In 1988, Rush Limbaugh started on a Saturday afternoon in Sacramento, California. And now they talk about especially the liberals talk about conservative talk radio is attacking us and killing us. No, what they're doing is influencing the masses. Thank God for conservative talk radio. That didn't exist in 1988. Well, Hispanic conservative radio doesn't exist now. We're going to change that. Amen. But it's a great point, Dr. Torres, about that. Because, and you keep that in your mind, the influence of the masses. Somebody's either doing it to you or you're doing it to them. And when I say doing it to them, it's actually messaging so we can bring them aboard and, and so we can live Ameri you know, the dream that we all want to here in America. Sam Rodriguez, by the way, an amazing uh, 20, 25 minutes you shared, my brother. Um, 21, uh, 21 minutes, 27. 21 seconds? 20. <laughs> Sam wasn't on Cuban time. We were done about 45. <laughs> Sam, Sam is like LeBron. He doesn't have a bad night. Oh, God. You can tell I'm a Heat fan. Uh, I'm going to give you a hug. I have to. <laughs> My brother, um, talk to us a little bit. I mean, you're all over, as Matt said, you're all over the country. You've seen every movie, as they say. You've seen a lot of things. Talk to us about how we can literally engage this group, which should be with us, walking and building this country. One is, it's more of the external that the congressman referenced, the external level of engagement. To do that, let me, let me sort of frame the optics for you, and some of you have heard this in some of the CNN speeches that I've given, which is simple. We are Hispanic. You have to break, I was in a news conference with John McCain a few years ago, and I was asked by a reporter, why are there so many people fearing this Hispanic influx? And I went, because we are Hispanic. You have to break that down, two syllables. First, capital H, his. Second, panic. <laughs> So the reporter looked at me and said, what are you saying? And I went, we are his paddock. We're not here to teach America salsa, merengue, or cha-cha-cha. We're not here to make anyone invest wisely or unwisely in Taco Bell. And we're not here to make anyone press one for English or two for Spanish. We are Hispanic. We, believe it or not, are here to bring panic to the kingdom of darkness in the name of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. I believe... The prophetic purpose of this community is to be facilitators for a third awakening. Uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I think we're going to see a fresh revival across the land. Nevertheless, we need to redeem those optics. Number two, we have to reconcile Abraham Lincoln's justice motif upon which the Republican Party was founded with Ronald Reagan's optimism. 
If, if you want to see Hispanics coalesce around the conservative movement, resurrect the message of Abraham Lincoln. Resurrect the optimism of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, in 1986, declared, he said, Hispanics, they are natural conservatives even if they don't know it yet. That's what he said. Traditionalist was the term he used. And they need to be engaged. So if we resurrect Ronald Reagan's optimism with Abraham Lincoln's justice platform, then we're going to see Hispanics coalesce. Then, number three, we have to redeem the narrative, which means, what is conservatism? What does it mean to be a conservative? Are we conserving a, a pigmentation, a color schemata? Are we, what are we conserving? If you say we are conserving the values that make this nation great, and, and by the way, we're gonna explain them. I don't care if the left hates this, there is such an animal as American exceptionalism. There is, it does exist. And I'm gonna tell you what it is. It's this radical, transformative, revolutionary idea that no one ever heard before. The French Revolution, a few years after ours, couldn't be duplicated, and they haven't been stable ever since because they couldn't emulate this crazy idea that it's God over man and man over government. Yeah. When Mark Nuttall shared that, that little teaching with me, it revolutionized my life. We want to incorporate that because, by the way, there's limited space, and if one of them grows, the other have to move out of the way. So if government grows, God and man are pushed out of the way. That's why we, in Latinos, internally, we are pro-life. We are definitely pro-familia. We definitely have come from totalitarian regimes. We know what it is to experience big government firsthand. So we, we understand intrinsically why limited government and entrepreneurship and faith and freedom and religious liberty are the core values of this nation. What we need to do is message that. So instead of the rhetoric that we saw in the immigration debate that at times, at times was so polarizing, let's, let's get away from that. Let's look at the Hispanic American community and say, we want you, we need you, you are us, we are together, this is our nation. And, and by the way, these, these individuals are not bringing these intrusive back. What are the values? God-fearing, family-loving, and hard work. If these values intimidate Americans, we're in bad shape. And at the end of the day, I agree with Cindy. It's not about being Hispanic or black or white or yellow. We are all Americans. It's about being Americans. It's about this great melting pot called the American experience. But we must engage them in order to really activate this community. I do believe that the Hispanic American community will be the firewall of righteousness and justice in the 21st century. Totally. Amen. Amen. Hispanics also have this crazy notion that a man should be married to a woman. Too, which is, I heard it somewhere. I think it was in the Bible. Wait, um, it, is in the Bible. it is in the Bible. It is in the Bible. Um, Yuri Montilla, we finally got to you, my friend. And I know you've got a lot to say. Um, uh, by the way, you should be running for senator in the state of California, by the way. I'm going to start that campaign, okay? We're going to be Barber Boxers, Boxers out. Okay. <laughs> We're campaigning for you, Yuri. <laughs> All right, Yuri. Yuri Montilla. Well, Sam, you mentioned Ronald Reagan. Yes. I think we need to understand the immigrant experience. Ronald Reagan said that America is like a shining uh, uh, city uh, upon a hill, a shining city upon a hill. That means that immigrants to this country come mainly for two reasons. One, those that are suffering persecution, political persecution, escaping Islamic fundamentalist regimes, others escaping communism, the ones uh, uh, coming from Cuba, because they see that. They see a shining city upon a hill. The others, the ones that come mainly from Mexico, are the ones that are escaping economic oppression. They cannot survive in those countries where there is so much corruption. So therefore, America gives an opportunity to immigrants to come to this country. I remember when I came to the United States around 20 years ago, I remember thinking, this is the greatest, greatest nation in the world. Why, why this country gives so some, some many opportunities to people like myself? And it, 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 it took a couple of years uh, for me to understand that it's because of the Christian worldview that this, this country is great. It is because of our belief that God has designed the universe. It is because of our belief in the fact that each human being has been created in God's image that we can have a country as powerful as the United States. And I remember then 10 years ago, I became a US citizen in the city of Denver, Colorado. 
And when you become a US citizen, you need uh, to, to give an oath of allegiance uh, to the Constitution of the United States. And as, as we know, the Declaration of Independence is the philosophical foundation of the Constitution. And the Declaration of Independence is very clear about these uh, fundamental principles. It's very clear about the fact that we have inalienable rights because God gives us those fundamental uh, natural rights. It's not the government that gives us uh, you know, those fundamental rights. It's not the United Nations for sure, but it is God. So in that context, those fundamental uh, rights are the right to life since the, since the time of conception, the right to marriage as the union between a man and a woman, the right to religious freedom and economic freedom as well. Unfortunately, right now, there is a systematic effort to deconstruct, to destroy the meaning of natural rights. So we have a liberal agenda that is telling us that sexual and reproductive rights are the main paradigm in the United States. There is a clash, a clash of worldviews, a clash of ideas. On one hand, those that believe in sexual and reproductive rights, which means abortion and homosexuality. On the other hand, those of us, as part of the immigrant community, that believe in natural rights, the right to life, the right to family, the right to religious freedom. In this context, the Hispanic community is decisive. Is the Hispanic community going to embrace the lies of extreme liberalism that is trying to legalize homosexual marriage in this country? Is the Hispanic community going to embrace the pro-abortion agenda? Or is the Hispanic community going to embrace the pro-life, pro-family, pro-religious freedom agenda? This is a decisive moment in the history of the United States. And I believe, and I strongly agree with my brother, Sam Rodriguez, that Hispanics are going to embrace a pro-life, pro-family perspective. This is a prophetic movement, the awakening. This is a movement that is trying to transcend ethnicities. This is a movement that is trying to be relevant for all generations. We are a prophetic movement, but not all conservatives understand the importance of what we are doing. That's why I believe that we need to continue to work so we will continue to defend those natural rights. We will continue to embrace Ronald Reagan's ideas so that the United States will continue to be that shiny city upon a hill and that we will be able to defeat the ideologies of extreme Marxism, Islamic fundamentalists, liberalists. And we need to work cl very closely with the Hispanic community so that we can preserve the right to life since the time of conception, the right to marriage as the union between a man and a woman, and the right to religious freedom. Amen. Wow. I'm voting for him. Very good. I'm voting for him. You know, the I'm one thing I think everybody has got to see, and everybody has a story, no matter what their nationality is now, but if you look at Hispanics, there's always interesting stories. Um, my father was 20 years old, was fighting Castro, and they were looking for him to put him on a firing squad. This was way be a couple of years before me. Um, had to leave at 12 o'clock at night with bullets going over his head. And hoping, hoping that on a very small boat with five guys, somehow, in the middle of the night, you're going to find land. Thankfully, there was one pretty good navigator on that little boat. And they got to Miami. And then he went back to fighting the Bay of Pigs. And then when he was 10 years later, they tried to assassinate my father four times, including a bomb that didn't detonate that was four feet from my room. Wow. So in other words, wow. what was not liberty was coming over here to liberty to try to attack. So there's a lot of Hispanics. There's stories everywhere that wow. not only from Mexico and Central America, wow. South America, many stories I can share and some sad ones from Cuba. But you know what? I was born in Miami Beach, Florida. I have a beautiful wife of 25 years. I've got three great kids. They all love this country. And I can say that pretty much across the board if you're talking about Hispanics, okay? And I remember one time at, a, at an event we did with Matt at Valley Voter Summit, and we had a Q&A, and a lady in the back said, you know, I'm concerned a little bit about this Hispanic thing because I'm afraid that everybody is going to be speaking Spanish. And I let her talk, and I let her talk. I don't know if Matt remembers this. I let her talk, and this, I'm very concerned. And I go, ma'am, you can sleep at night. Very tranquil. Why is that? Because I've got three kids born here, and I can't get them to speak Spanish. And that's the truth. 
they assimilate. They're part of this country. Okay? Um, I would die for it. They would. Okay? They would. You would. Okay? But we're all Americans. And that's the important thing we got to focus on right now. You know, Congressman, so great to have you here. I'd like to get a perspective. I mean, you've got the vision. You know, you're doing it in New Mexico in a very tough state. You're doing it. And being a non-Hispanic, but with a Hispanic heart, what can we do to message to Congress, to the people in the Beltway? I mean, we were talking about messaging outside the Beltway. What can we do to message inside the Beltway? How can it ever change where, especially on the, cons on the Republican side, um, they can see the Hispanics as natural allies, at least all of them. Some of them do, like you. Some don't. What can we do? Send people who understand it. I, I will tell you the truth. I always get the question, how can we convince the senator to vote for our ideas? How can we convince this congressman that we're right? And I said, you can't. The crosswinds are too strong. You have to understand before you go. So we need to understand who it is that we're, we're supporting in the elections, who we're voting for, and then we need to hold them accountable. And I will tell you, as we elect people who understand who their maker is, who acknowledge the power of God in their lives, they have a natural tendency to have an open life to those with similar values. And then we have to just get them out of the comfort zone. I'm, I, I grew up on the south end of town, uh, at Hobbs, New Mexico, uh, blacks, Hispanics, and Anglos in the same 4-H club in 1957, 58. I will guarantee you that was happening nowhere else in the country. We didn't know it different. And so when I came to office, it was just natural to go into those poor communities because that's where I grew up and I didn't recognize the differences. And that's a blessing that, that I came with. I didn't learn it afterwards. So the first thing, find candidates who understand it and you don't have to convince them. That's a great, that's a great point. You're right, and once people go to D.C., if they've got a mindset to turn that around is, is nearly impossible. Cindy, you go, you travel a lot to South and Central America, uh, and, and I don't know, you've probably been in every country in all likelihood down there. What's the perception? I know there's a lot of people over there that also want to be in the States. They want some freedom. What, what's your perspective of those Hispanics and, and, and really the family attitude that's in those, in those different countries? Well, you know, I think that they're very disconcerted about what's happening in America because they believe in the America we believe in as conservatives, and they're grieved, and they're praying for us, one. And I think that, uh, you know, there, there's a great unity that they see standing with us. I mean, when I'm in Mexico, uh, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, we're praying for you. But I think that one thing that, you know, if I can bring the R word up in this conversation, which is not Republican, it's racism, that it is still alive and well in America. And, you know, maybe not in our hearts, but in our culture. And that we have got to intentionally talk about it. You know, if we talk heart to heart with our family here, and some of their families, they would tell you horror stories. You know, I live in an area, it's BMW, black, Mexican, white. And so I'm, I'm like the token white, all right, in some of my areas. But, you know, it's been very, very good for me because I have heard a lot of sorrow. And I think one reason that we, that we as Anglo people don't understand why Latino people are the way they are is we just don't eat with them. We don't sit down and take time to be family. And you know, it, we, I, you know I, I said that, I talked about being family first. I mean, even if we look at our crowd here, who we are, you know, it would be my dream that would be, we would be much more racially diverse. And I know that Matt's worked on that. But, and, and so these men, you know, each of them that love this nation desperately would lay down their life for it. 
You know, we have got to find out how to tear down this invisible barrier that is still here. And many of us have worked at it really, really hard. But we say things that are paternalistic and we're clueless. And we act paternalistically. So I believe that the challenge that we have is to really love each other. And I'm, I know I keep sounding so simple, but I just read things in the Bible like that, and it really, really works. There's a lot of stuff in that Bible. It's pretty good. Hey, you know what? Um, we've, got, we've got about 10 minutes, and I want to I wanna be able to open the forum yeah, to cool. all of you great people that are here today for questions and answers, uh, questions from you, answers hopefully from us, some good ones. Uh, concerning uh, the Hispanics, election, whatever's on your mind, we, we have this time that we want to set aside for you. Tony. Quick yes, com- sir. Yes, Sam. Quick comment. 72% voted for Obama. The two staunchest support groups for Romney in the Latino community, who were they? It's kind of rhetorical. I have the answer, but I'm just... What do you think? No, no, not far from it, not Puerto Ricans. Cubans... And 50%, there's a little poll that says 51% of Hispanic evangelicals voted for Obama, but that poll, it's 51.2, yeah. 50% of Hispanic evangelicals who voted like 80% before for Bush, 50% voted for Romney and Cubans. Hispanic evangelicals and Cubans are the two most loyal, diehard, go get them, pro-life, pro-family supportive groups that voted for the conservative cause. Just to say. We could build on that, but just, just to give you a little bit of information there. Well, that's great information. At the same time, I'm in Miami, and I can tell you that trend is changing yeah. in Miami. Lamentably, that trend is changing. And I, it's changing. It, it used to be 80. With Reagan, it was 90% conservative. Um, with uh, the, second, the first Bush, maybe 70% conservative. Uh, maybe about 60% with the second Bush, and right now it's probably 50, 50, 40. It it may be going the other way in in Miami, Florida right now Um, because we're not messaging right. We're not messaging right. And the other guys are just lying. So if we don't message right and the other guys are lying, if if you don't have wisdom and knowledge about things, you'll flow. And if you're lied to, you you can go that way. Well, we got to avoid that. We've got to avoid that at all costs. Do we have any questions in the audience? We got over here. Yes, sir. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> no. Uh, who wants to repeat that question and answer it? I'll take it. He said that Rush Limbaugh said that the uh, immigration bill was simply an attempt to register 11 million Democrats and w- w- it through naturalization. Yeah. And so um, it's my belief that we need fundamental immigration reform. I'm not wild about the amnesty position that is created in this one. It's bringing people back. Uh, but I also caution my friends that if you think we're going to pass an immigration bill and suddenly get 50% of the Hispanic vote, you're dreaming because uh, the, the head of the Republican Party just came to New Mexico. We put the largest group of Hispanics in the room with him. At an hour and a half, he said, hey, when are you going to bring up the immigration? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's important, but we're going to go back to to jobs and the future and education and that thing. And so the Hispanic community is looking for, our, for, for us to give their kids a hand up through education. They're looking for the opportunity just to recognize the fruits of their labor. Yes, and we should pass an immigration bill, but it shouldn't have certain provisions in it, and it should create an open border. So uh, it, it's a mixed message. Um, I think uh, I like Rush. Uh, I think that would not bring 11 million votes. Again, if we message correctly, um, and even if Rush does it from his podium, where Hispanics are naturally conservative, I think we're going to be able to swing a lot of people in that direction. All right. I was born in Nicaragua, and I was blessed to have come here when I was 18 years old. I've always voted Republican, and I worked for Mitt Romney and McCain, and I'm a chairman of a fashion show for the suburban Republican women 
um, federated, federated. So I'm very involved with other women in Republican expansion, but I don't know what to do other than to, um, well, I told this um, Senator Micah when I met him that I had a dream. And he said, what's your dream? My dream is that we have a TV station that will compete with Univision and there you with go. Telemundo. Let me tell you, That's you're, you're right on, you're, let me tell you, you're right on point. Sam and I were talking about it. Obviously, on the radio side, that is my number one mission today. Thankfully, I've been launching all these Christian Spanish stations, which needed to be launched. And right now, the future lies in media, influence of the masses. God bless you. And by the way, you're completely correct. There needs to be a Fox, if you want to call it that, Spanish. And we're, let me tell you something. People on this, on this panel right here and some others are going to push the door in to try to make that happen. God bless you because you're right on point. Your point on messaging is everything. And the conservatives just simply, they have the greatest product on the planet Earth to sell, and they can't sell it. And I don't understand how that's possible. They're business-minded, they're entrepreneurial, they love God, and they can't sell with passion. I don't know how that's possible. But your point was that we have to educate for the next 20 to 30 to 40 years, the Hispanics are going to influence the next elections and the destiny of our nation. But we have now this common core ideology that's being jammed onto the school systems. So we're going to taxpayer fund an education that's anti-shining city on the hill. Yeah. How yeah. are we going to defeat that with your help? Otherwise, we're from cradle to grave, they're going to be taught that this, the light doesn't shine on the hill. It's a tarnished bulb. How are we going to defeat this? Great, great question, guys. Who wants to take that? We're over time already, but who wants to take that? Senator, uh, Congressman? Well, uh, we can go further. You're exactly right. We as conservatives message very poorly. Uh, Republicans don't negotiate very well in, in political office. Uh, they don't fight very well. We don't argue very well, debate very well. The only reason we ever win is because we're right on the issues. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so one of, the, one of the tasks that I'm taking on is trying to, to get the messaging better from us in Congress. And so I was just talking to Kathy McMorris Rogers just yesterday saying, you know, you've got this coming up. Don't talk about that. Talk about the effect in people's lives, not about fracking or about drilling oil wells, but the price of gasoline. When we relate it to people, we win the issues all the time. But you're right. Amen. Uh, any, any parting thoughts here? Because I think we're going to have to leave. We're a minute and a half over. On that particular question? Christian schools. Christian schools is a firewall. Homeschooling movement. And I'm not saying some, and we, we need that to really take off. And if we, we just can't permit this continual indoctrination. But if we are going to, if some of our kids can't get out, can't afford, you know, private schools, whatever it may be, then we need some serious Christ followers as teachers and principals and administrators to go in there. Because we understand that schools now are mission fields for Christians. That's what it is. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you, and uh, I want to thank this great, great panel. Yuri Montilla, Sam Rodriguez, Dr. Juan Torres, Cindy Jacobs, Congressman Steve Pierce, New Mexico. God bless you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.